that our bookstore resides on the ancestral, unceded land of the Confederate tribes of Warm Springs. In our immediate area are also the unceded lands of the Confederate tribes of Celeste Indians and the tribes of Grand Ronde. We encourage everyone to learn more about the land you occupy and the story of its peoples. If you're looking for books like that, please check our local section or ask one of our booksellers. We'd be happy to help you find them. And then a quick reminder of some upcoming events. On Tuesday the 27th, Virginia Hartman will join us in the store to discuss her book, The Marsh Queen, a debut novel with comparisons to Where the Crawdads Sing. And on Thursday the 29th, we'll be live streaming with Ashley Winstead for her mystery, The Last Housewife, a dark thriller about a woman determined to take down a patriarchal cult. So be, be sure to visit roundaboutbookshop.com for more information about our events and book clubs. And then just a reminder that this event is being recorded for our YouTube channel where you can find recordings of our events back to May 2020. So if there's one that you missed, or if you know someone who couldn't make it here tonight, please tell them to check that out. <clears throat> tonight, we are so pleased to welcome Kathy Eccles Hooker and David Young Wolf and their book, Voices of Navajo Mothers and Daughters, Portraits of Beauty. So a little bit about our uh, author and photographer. Kathy Eccles Hooker grew up in the Virginia suburb of Washington, D.C. She was introduced to Native American cultures as a child watching Native dancers perform at the Department of the Interior. She and her husband moved to the Navajo Reservation in the 1970s, where she taught English to DNA students at Dilcon Boarding School. While there, she studied Navajo traditional lifeways, and from her research wrote, Time Among the Navajo, Traditional Lifeways on the Reservation. She has taught English at Flagstaff Unified School District for 33 years, where again, she worked with DNA students. And then during nearly 44 years in Los Angeles, professional photographer David Young Wolf became one of America's top producers of stock photography. He later moved from stock photography to a niche, shooting yoga, fashion photography, and creative por portraiture, excuse me, capturing evocative images for his clients while also working on personal photography projects. He now lives uh, and photographs here in Bend, Oregon. So that's how we kind of got connected because David here is local, and so we're so happy to bring this book to our local uh, community. Um, and I'm gonna give it over to you guys because I wanna know more about this book as well. So thank you so much. Just so that you know, we and I'll tell you that the 
this a little bit later, but we, we went to college together 52 years ago. That's when we graduated. Uh, and there are some people of friendly faces that also went to that college in this room. We also have a former teacher from Flagstaff in this room, so that's pretty, feels like old home week in some ways. So this is a map of, the, of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and of the Navajo Reservation, of course, is in the Navy section. There are three states that hold the Navajo Reservation, uh, mostly in Arizona, and we did most, we did all of our interviews and photo shoots in Arizona. We did, uh, there's a, you know, a small section in uh, Utah that does have uh, high school, middle school, elementary school for students, and then there's a, another section, of course, in, in New Mexico. So that little blob, or big blob, that's white in the center is the Hopi Reservation. And the Navajo Reservation obviously surrounds that entire reservation. So, <clears throat> Sam, I look at the flight staff, it's about 400 maybe, let's call it 500 miles. Um, and we figured we drove at least 200 miles once we got there. So every trip to Flagstaff was 1,200 miles. And you combine that by 12, that's over 14,000 miles we drove to do this. The Bible's were known. We didn't figure that out until <laughs> <laughs> If I had only known before you. <laughs> OK, so. So now I'll tell you, when we were in college, it was a small college in Ohio, uh, David was called Wolfie, and I was called Crinkle. And only the people that know me during that time call me Crinkle, still. Uh, I got a little more mature and became Kathy after I graduated from college, but uh, my husband calls me Crinkle, David calls me Crinkle, so it's gonna be hard to do a switch. Yeah, Pam calls me Pringle. So we had Pringle, Wolfie, and Pam there. <laughs> okay, so we went to college together 52 years ago. We, we remained friends. Pam was my roommate in college. And we made, remained friends, uh, you know, years later and later. Uh, and we both moved west. My husband, who also went to this small college, and I moved to Flagstaff, Arizona. Well, first we moved to the Navajo Reservation and then on to Flagstaff, Arizona. And I was a teacher on the reservation, as Julie said, teaching students who did not speak English, but mostly Navajo, how to speak English. Uh, David and Pam moved on to Santa Monica, California, where David became a, a top LA photographer for that area and other areas too. And his wife, uh, Pam, was also his assistant. So we had our separate careers, but we would still have contact with, uh, with each other. So the last part is <coughs> one day we were, well, I'll go back one step. Kathy slash Google has another book that she did before this, and another photographer did the book, but I printed the prints for Google. And then, I don't know, a few years later, we're sitting in the hot tub at Crinkle's house. <laughs> and I said, if you ever do another book, I would love to do the photography for it. So that's the ask. And I, I was thrilled because I knew of David's photography and how uh, fantastic it was. And, and so um, I thought, I'm interested in Navajo women and mothers and daughters. This would be perfect. Please say yes. Please say yes. And he did say yes. And I told him, you know, you have to drive a long way. You're not going to make any money. You don't want to do it. And he said, yeah, yeah, we, we, we will do it. We will do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started in 2009, and it's now 2022. So it was a very, very long and involved process. But in 2009, David and Pam would load up all their photography equipment in the back of their Highlander, bring it to Flagstaff. We would move it over into my car. The next morning, we had I had set up a contact for an interview, and we would drive on to the reservation, sometimes on, or many times on dirt roads, to meet a contact. 
Sometimes we were lucky enough to meet them at a school or at a gas station, and then they would take us on to their family camp, is what it's called, or it's like their ranch. And um, it, it was interesting because there are no like real mailboxes on the reservation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just kind of out there. Oh, I live by the trees, or I live by that butte, or I live close to that mesa. So that part, as far as directions, we definitely needed someone to, to help us uh, to get there. Once we would get to the family's camp, lots of people were usually around, but we were zeroing in on uh, Navajo mothers uh, and their daughters. A lot of times we had four generations of family there. Uh, an elder grandma, great grandma. In fact, on the cover of the book, there is a great grandmother and then a grandmother and then uh, two mothers and three daughters. So there, you know, it was it was wonderful to keep finding that kind of consistency to, to have this in the book. Yeah. So. Um, we would meet the family. They didn't know us at all except for the contact. And luckily the contact all, all, always seemed I had worked with many of them, so they knew who I was, or there was a, a connection of trust somewhere in that because we literally walked into their lives. Pam and Dave had never been on the reservation before, did not know if they would what, what, you know, what would happen there. Uh, yes, sir. We were from Dilcon. Oh, that's right. Yeah, when, when my husband and I lived in Dilcon, which is 40 miles north of Winslow, Pam and Dave uh, did drive through and spent a couple of nights with us then, but that was pretty much it. And so we would go in either to the family's home or sit outside, and we needed a kind of a settling in period, which most Navajos like to have happen. And then I started to ask questions, and they seemed to relax more after the first or second question. And what was uh, interesting from the interviews is that there was a lot of laughter from their answers. There were at times deep, sobbing tears mm -hmm. that, that went along with you know what I was asking. And uh, it was an, an amazing experience to be invited into their homes and to have their personal lives um, shared. Uh, we would then, af after the interviews, then they would, would, that would locate a place to photograph them. We did, not once did we ever tell them what to wear. And that's why I think the cover is so shocking because it's so, it's so beautifully done. David, David positioned them all dressed the way they wanted to. I am, I am going to read uh, just the first two paragraphs to let you know my thinking on this book. She does a lot of reading. One Mother's Day morning, I read an article about the relationship between a Navajo mother and her daughter in my local newspaper in Flagstaff, Arizona, the Arizona Daily Sun. It brought back memories of the time my husband and I lived on the Navajo Reservation at Dilcon Boarding School more than 35 years ago. We both worked with Navajo children. He was their dentist and I was their teacher. The article, um, I'm sorry, next paragraph. When I lived at Delcon, I spent time with my students' families and witnessed the close bonds between parents and children. Moms and daughters wove rugs, picked Navajo tea, harvested ears of Indian corn, and cooked blood sausage. They worked side by side, occasionally quiet, and other times chatting softly in Navajo. Watching them work and relate to each other inspired me. I wondered if this connection between mothers and daughters remained strong. I wanted to establish a personal relationship with Navajo women, learn of their hopes, sorrows, and joys, and hear their touching life stories. This longing pulled me back to the reservation. The result is voices of Navajo mothers and daughters, portraits of beauty, a collection of interviews and photographs of amazing, strong, and resilient Navajo women across generations. Now, we 
Cam and Dave and I did not do this book by ourselves. It started with the three of us, but from that we ended up with contacting people that could connect us with other Navajo mothers and daughters. And in the end, we had uh, 10 different people helped us with that because I was grabbing and talking. I want to do this book, who do you know who can help me? And uh, one helper in, it's, it's a quite unique story. His name is Dr. Jim Kiefer. He was superintendent of instructions in the Sanders School District, which is on the Navajo Reservation. And it was the end of school. Parents were there checking out their children. Teachers, some were in their classroom, some were in the halls, students in the halls, parents in the halls. And he was walking up and down the hallway, yelling, anyone want to be in a book? Anyone want to be in a book? And from that, we ended up with nine families, which was a huge contribution to our book. So with contacts and uh, proofreaders, I had 14 different proofreaders because I struggled greatly with the introduction and conclusion. When we finally had our, our publisher, that was a team of seven. So it turned out there were 101 people that helped us create this lovely book. And how many of those people were actually involved? Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, just, uh, just 67. <laughs> so we had 67 mothers and daughters in the book. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about photography to start with. This is a hard one because it's from the capsule way. So we take photographs and start to we do it to connect moments to each other. Eternity and new image made tangible. There was something else I wanted to say. So I listened to the interviews and they talked about how these rooms were close by to them. And this is where the mom in the turquoise shirt went to preschool. So we walked over there and it turned out to be an amazing location. <clears throat> so the, the lady in the black shirt, she did that. And her mom was taking care of her son who's old. So um, we did an event at the Northern Arizona, Arizona Museum of Art, and her mom was there. And I made prints to give the people. It was pretty emotional to give them a print. Okay, the movie was called Code of Crime. From the quote came from the movie Code of Crime. If you're not a photographer, you probably won't like it, but if you are, I suggest it. So um, now we're going to talk about some of the things we learned. And, um, Kathy, you can talk about what's So this is a, a, a woman who realized, I think it was in her 30s, that she was forgetting her mother and grandmother's stories. And it was worrying her. So then she thought she would start writing down stories at first. First it was a page or two, but then sometimes when you start to write down your stories from the past, more and more thoughts do bounce up and start coming to help you out. And at, at this time, we have down the 33 journals. Um, you want to just go ahead and press that button? But um, really, I looked back in the book and it was 22, but I bet by now there are 42, 43 journals. And so this was all of her history, and what she wanted to do was share those with her children. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't all really sad, but this was kind of a, a fun event. So the, the lady with the white t-shirt on is the daughter, and she's a graphic designer and artist, and you can see her work on the, work on the bottom of the skateboard. She's pretty, pretty good. And uh, one of the things that's amazing is the relationships that the moms and daughters have. Um, the mom had an arranged marriage. I'm gonna let Kathy talk about that. So it, 
I didn't realize that arranged marriages occurred in the Navajo Nation until I was halfway through the interviews with women. And um, when it was brought up this time around, it turned out that the parents of this woman and her husband, those moms were best friends. And so, yeah. husband's parents, yeah, were, were best friends. And so, those two women cooked up <laughs> that, the, that this woman and her son would get married. And um, it's interesting, she said that her husband's name was Jackie. And she said, Jackie was always a jock. And he would hang out at his house with all of his buddies. And I would be over there because Jackie's mother was sewing clothes for her. And um, she said, Jackie always ignored me. Uh, and in the end, when she was 16 and he was 18, uh, they got married. And they're still together. And life is just doing great for them whenever I contact them. And the interesting part also about Jackie uh, is that he is an Elvis impersonator <laughs> at a local casino. And so he, he's got his costumes, the grandiose Elvis costumes all folded up. Which he had shows. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. For sure. And then the hands. So, so we're doing this photograph. And there's, you, you've got to imagine there's some people standing around, other members of the family, Ann and Crinkle. And I'm, I'm working away, and I start to feel something crawling up my legs. And pretty soon, it was like incredibly painful, and everybody else starts laughing because they know what's going on. And they yell, just take your pants off, take your pants off, <laughs> which I did. And eventually, uh, the pain subsided. But that's what I learned. Don't stand on an anthill when you're photographing. Well, uh, red anthill. I don't care what color they are, I'm not seeing them out of here. This is four generations. I'm going to assume you can, well, David said it's short to tall. How do you put it? Short is the old, oldest, the tallest is the youngest. Right, so that labels who's who in this photo. Sure. Great grandma. Grandma, mom, daughter. So, so um, this was a very, very touching and at times shocking interview for us. And um, the grandmother, great grandmother, was a weaver. The great grandmother was a weaver. So, um, so, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so the great grandmother was a weaver, and her husband left her with eight children, and she, the only economic help she had came from her weaving. And this is a, an event that her daughter shared with us, and her daughter is the one with the dark sunglasses on. It was hard for me to be raised up. I didn't want my kids to go through what I went through. I wanted them to have a better life than I did. Sometimes we would run out of food. We would not have anything to eat. And when we were starting to get hungry, my mom had to hurry and we would run. She had to take it to the store and sell it so she could get groceries. The trip to the store was not an easy one, an easy one day trip. It was like a week in a wagon to get to the store to sell the rug. It would be about a 40 mile trip to Gallup, New Mexico in the wagon. She would tell us, oh, she would leave us with tortillas for that week along with water. We had to take tiny bits each day and it was to last until she got home. That is how we were and it was hard. I used to be really, really skinny and now look at me. I wish I was still that skinny. We had no shoes, and we used to run around without them. We had the calluses on our feet, so we would not get cactus stuck in them. There were nine of us in the hogan, and it was crowded. And a hogan is their, their shelter, and I'll talk more about that later. 
Lots of times we would only have breakfast and then not eat all day. We got used to not eating all day. If we got hungry, we would chew plants and pick berries and get full on them. When it would rain, we would drink the water from the mud puddles. It used to taste really good. We were like wild animals and we had to live off nature. So I heard him say this when I was sitting in their, in their home and I thought, wow, I'm at home in Cleveland watching color TV and she's drinking the water out of the puddles. So it kind of brings it, it wasn't like in the 1800s, this was like, I know I'm old, but I'm not that old, it was, it was pretty current. The, the sad and tragic part continues because um, this woman, the, the mom, is, her name is Arlinda, and Arlinda's mother and her, her brother, uh, this woman's brother died of COVID in December of 2020, and her grandmother died of old age in 2020 in December, so three deaths in, uh, in a month was just so traumatic for Arlinda. And I, when I, and I was in contact with her after our interviews, and when the book finally arrived, she called me and told me how everyone cried and cried when she saw the book and how much it meant to her to have pictures of her mom and, and her grandmother uh, with her now. Before we move on, I didn't really talk about um, what I wanted to accomplish, accomplish photographically. And before we started shooting, I kind of wanted to like capture the environment of where they were, um, do close-ups, and kind of show the interactions of the mothers and daughters. So I just wanted to bring that up as we look at more of the photos. This is a, a, a young girl, she's about 10 years old. 
she is not ready for her kinalda, which is a puberty ceremony. And Navajo young girls, when they get their period, when they start menstruating, they announce it to the entire community where they are living. Whereas us Anglos tend to hide it, keep it secret. That is not what they do. And they have a four-day ceremony where the girl goes through lots of running, lots of corn grinding. Um, it is a, a, a celebration that you are entering w womanhood. And what is amazing to me is the girls we interviewed in, in, the, in the book, um, they use that experience and it, they draw strength from it when they are adults uh, and, and older. They get they have you know, more confidence and they feel more secure in, I guess, who they are. Um, if you can look carefully, this little girl is inside of a hogan. And a hogan is usually an eight-sided structure. It was the living quarters for Navajos for centuries and centuries. Uh, and lately now, maybe within the past 20 years, uh, it is used more for ceremonial uh, aspects, but um, this hogan is amazing because uh, you can, it's built with logs and mud. The roof is a dome shape. We've got some pictures in the book of it. Uh, and then sometimes rocks also are used in the construction. This hogan, the little girl is in, her grandmother, great, great, no grandmother, her grandmother was born in this very hogan. And here she is standing in it, you know, 10 years ago. So we think that that was quite amazing. Yeah, oh yes, all the doors, and I check that out constantly when I go to the reservation. Every door on the reservation, whether it's a trailer or what, always faces east to welcome the sun in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now hold on please, that's right. So this is uh, three horses for one bride. I love this. In the book, this, this gal told us that her father said, women back in the day were not that experienced, were not that expensive. Well, we got your mom for three horses. <laughs> and I just thought, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. So um, this was an arranged marriage. She was 16, he was 18 also. And, um, she was a real brute, is how her daughter described her. Uh, she worked like a man, is what she'd say to me. And she'd just follow along and follow along whatever her husband was doing. She was right behind him to help. Now, the next term is placenta. And this family talked about this more than any other family we interviewed. After, uh, you know, the baby is born and then the placenta, I guess, is expelled or comes out. Uh, this mom and other Navajo women kept the placenta, took it home, and hung it on trees at her camp. Sometimes when you have a placenta and it's a, the baby is a girl, you bury it in the sheep corral, hoping that that child will become a weaver. Uh, so if you're a, a, a boy, you are put in your, your placenta, it may be buried in uh, a corral, with horses or cattle, and maybe uh, you'll be a rodeo rider, or you'll be uh, just involved with cattle and horses on the land. Um, and so this, this woman named Rebecca took May's placenta and buried it. When, after May had her, her children, she did the exact same thing, and then uh, May now has grandchildren, and she also has the exact same, has done the exact same thing. Uh, one sad part, it, it took us quite a while to find the right publisher. And when uh, Rebecca was dying, she told May one of her biggest regrets was that she could not see the book. She knew it was coming out, but she just didn't quite make it. So that was a very difficult situation.
right, so be prepared for anything that might happen. And um, I'll say a couple of things about the photograph, but the first thing is I saw that dog coming. And was that actually able to take his picture just as that one spot where he shows the feet on behind the people uh, we want to guide. So it's just, as a photographer, you've got to be prepared to, to grab the moment any time you can. Also, the environment here, it was raining pretty, pretty good. We were using umbrellas to keep from dry while we set up everything, and then we did get the photo. So dealing with the elements, here again it was raining, but this situation, it was so windy that Pam and Creeper could barely hold it. We had a big light, we had to go, a teeny little light that the wind wouldn't affect. Um, Next. Strong winds. Oh, so we experienced heat. There's a lady coming up with a photograph that was over 100 degrees. And like we were suffering and she didn't know what the problem was. <laughs> it was cold. Grandma's corral. So there's Grandma with a little bandana on her head. And these corrals, they're pretty heavy duty. They're, they're made of wood. They're made of mattresses. Springs and stuff and everything, and they eventually somebody's got to move them because there's too much manure or they just need to go to, to a cleaner spot. And this lady, she did it all by herself. It's pretty amazing. She's one tough lady. And so we we're, we we're working on the shoot, and you know, like she looks good, and I don't like to make people do what they don't want to, but I asked the lady in the red coat if she could ask her mom to smile, and she said she is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she never, she never, we couldn't do anything to change that expression, but she was a sweetheart. And there's, there's another photo inside her house. She's got these chickens in a box next to her wood burning stove just to keep them warm. There's, she, it's the things you see, I have pictures of that, but not in this, so. Well, she has passed away, and she passed away, she's passed away, she passed away when she was 90. Yes. Yeah. A bow. I love the bow. Yeah. It's like, you want me to photograph this? Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, please let me do it. So, not everybody was happy to be photographed. This lady, um, and I don't think it's really her fault. It's like sometimes we weren't in charge. A lot of times, most of the time, we weren't in charge with the families, getting the families. So it was the responsibility of the person who did find the family to explain to them what we were doing. I don't think she had any idea what she was doing. All she knew is that they got her dressed up and we showed up and we were trying to do the group photo and she was like really upset. So I had to do something. I just We took her aside and somehow I was able to communicate with her. Um, and I don't speak Navajo. So um, we thought back on it and kind of, how, how do you do that? I mean, you be yourself, you, you, you know, you treat people with respect, uh, show people that you care about them, and act like you belong there and you know what you're doing, and then that inspires confidence. You can, you can emote that, I guess. So this one from being unhappy to being happy. Now, this photograph, this is Bertha, where it was over 100 degrees, and like she's not sweating, but we were. Um, and the reason we show this photograph is these photos don't just happen. Now, Bertha on the left, well, they're both Bertha, but the one on the left, she is standing in front of the territory that she got for, from the Navajo Nation. And like, there's nothing you can do with that. So basically, like, this is cheap. Yeah. Um, and we were fortunate that the wind kind of came up and did this with her skirt, which is just so cool. And she's just standing there doing her thing. So it was pretty neat. But the, the other thing is, this is a highly technical shot, even though it doesn't look like it. We've got, excuse me, this shadow here is a big diffuser on top of her diffusing the light that's coming down, otherwise the sunshine was way too bright. 
and we have another light coming in here. So even though they look pretty simple, um, some of them took a lot of work to get it to, to be just right. And we were sweating, even if she wasn't. <laughs> So her, her um, father-in-law, no, her son-in-law is a dentist in Flagstaff, and he made her false teeth, but has she ever worn them? <laughs> Never. And um, even to her grandson's wedding, she just would not, would not wear them. Uh, this interview and photo shoot was early on. I think it was our second one. And I was still a little nervous with David and Pam driving all this way, and what, what if it didn't turn out all right? I guess then we wouldn't do it. And after he, David took this photo, I was really nervous, and I was expecting him to be critical. And he looks at me, and he says, oh, crinkle. And I was waiting for it to come. He goes, this is amazing. <laughs> so, all right, all right. <laughs> Well, since we're shooting in, in my computer, we got to see the pictures right away. It's, it's, yeah. it's really a great way to work. Okay, so this is about a little bit more about the photography, and we'll talk about the people also. But when we showed up at this location, the sun wasn't where it is when we took the photograph, but I could see, like, oh my god, this is amazing because it shows a lot of the surrounding area. Um, and I knew the lighting was going to be really good, so let me just see what else I want there. So I had, before we even started shooting, before we even went there or something, I had an idea, of, I thought about what I wanted the photographs to be. Um, and none of them came close to what I imagined, because I couldn't imagine what we were going to do, but I did realize when I talked about it earlier, I wanted to show the scope of where they lived, the relationships with the people, and, and do some close-ups. This is on here. So we, even though the pictures didn't look like I envisioned, since I couldn't really envision them, I did have an idea, and that's what I went through every time we went to a location. Yeah, I, well, just that, as I said earlier, David would spend about three-fourths of the interview time with us, uh, getting to know them, and then he would go out and scout around and try and find something that connects well to the family. And it turned out uh, the mom here is a pastor, and her husband is a pastor, and this is their church, which is maybe 30 yards from their house. So those, that connection. When David first took it, I went, wow, that's weird. But then I realized the connection with the family, and it fits beautifully. So. You really I did. I'm telling you. <laughs> <I'm happy. laughs> This is just a little bit more about um, how I would work when we were shooting. It's like keep it simple, place darker areas against lighter areas so your hair shows up and your bright face is against the darker thing. Use focus to emphasize your eyes. Are the mom are sharp, the other ladies are like, I love this photograph. And then working with shapes and space. Even though there's people, they're really shapes taking up space. Or, not to the space. It works both ways. So a quick lesson thing to say about this, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, when we were doing this interview, I found out that the mom had been at Dilcon boarding school at the same time I had been at Dilcon boarding school. And I, you know, she was probably 10, but I may have seen her in the halls or somewhere. She lived in the dorm, and this was a very, very unhappy time in her life. And could really feel the bitterness coming through when she was talking about it. And it wasn't so much the teachers. Well, first, she desperately missed her family. Uh, it wasn't the teachers. It was the Navajo dorm aides that were not kind to her. And um, it, it was obviously very, very upsetting. She said she was poor. She didn't have extra money. Uh, and that the dorm aides were mean to her because of that. Um, lice is common on the Navajo reservation, so her long hair was cut, which was very traumatic, even though probably medically necessary. Um, and it just kind of surprised me that here we are again meeting so many years later, and she's uh, she's an adult. 
She's all she comes across and is a very strong individual, and she's well known for her running. She, she runs many races, and uh, that strength comes through in her personality. And also, um, our publisher is a runner, and she knows her and wishes she could run as fast. Excuse me, for, for just one. Of them. So here they are in one of the photos. Now, if you want this print, I'm here to give it away. I have a number in my pocket with a number between 1 and 50. And when we're done, as long as you're not related to me, <laughs> you can say a number and the closest number gets the print. Okay? So, um, Kringle's going to tell a story about these people, but this is just another example of trying to show their environment and, you know, this having a vision of what you want the photograph to look like and then being able to create that vision with whatever lighting you need. It. And uh, it's a pretty amazing family. They actually we ran into them again at the museum in Flagstaff. Uh, Kringle has a story here, which I need to give it a prompt for. I do want to tell you that the, the grandma uh, speaks three languages, has three master's degree, very, very highly educated woman who loves to talk about Navajo culture. In fact, her grandchildren complain because she talks so much about it. <laughs> so what I found interesting, not, not only with these people, but with others, is the kinds of toys that the children created because there was no going out and buying a Barbie doll or a Mac, small Mac truck or even a baseball for them. They had to create their own toys and and just 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 looking through the book, I was able to get a list of the toys. They would break uh, the necks of glass bottles and pretend they were horses. They would build small corrals with sticks and play rodeo with these glass horses. They would cut evaporated cans, milk cans, in two and put the front of the can on their toes and the back on their heels, heels and then pretend they were walking in high heels. They would tie a scarf around a rock and carry it like a baby. They would pretend to have a, a canalda. Um, they would balance on a corral and walk around it and around it, uh, on, you know, a pie on the fence for hours and hours, is what was told to me. Uh, they would take the Sears and Roebuck catalog and make paper dolls out of it. They had cars made out of small boxes. They had uh, rocks, pretend rocks for animals, and, um, or pretend animals for rocks, and then the classic one, and this is what this family did. They would take a watermelon, cut it in two, eat out the watermelon, put the helmets, the water, half of the watermelon, on their head, and then play war and throw rocks and sand at each other. <laughs> Which surprised me. And this is what the daughter's name is Tara, and this is what she and her brother did. It says, one, one funny story is that Tara and her brother would pack a lunch and ride two billy goats while they were herding sheep. One goat's name was Kawa, and the other's name was Saki. They pretended that, that these two goats were their motorcycles. They would call it woolly riding and get bucked off. They had a great time herding sheep. So very clever. So this is just to show you how we kind of worked each photo shoot. I will find a location, you know, we've got the whole guy in the background, and the people are all standing where they're approximately where we want them. So we've got the lighting set up, Crinkle's holding the flag, Pam's taking the picture. And once we get the lighting set up, then we do have everybody, we, uh, we work and get the pose finalized. And then we shoot. So this 
So I got a little video here. Um, and did all these photos, and hopefully it'll play. Let's see. Whoops. Wrong thing. This is an amazing canyon, and they actually would take their cattle down inside the canyon in the springtime, and they would brand them and things like that. And we got along so well, they invited us to come back, but it didn't work out. There, there's literally standing right on the edge of that canyon. You can see our shadows are way down there. Okay, so. Did you have a story? No, I will bring that back. Here. Yes. Okay. We practice on it. So um one of the things that that I did was I kept my eyes open and shot a lot of other stuff besides not the whole woman. And this is a, a perfect example. Um, and I did lots and lots of photos like this. And this photo is look, to me should be in the book, but it didn't make it. Um, and Krinkle's going to say why I think that. Oh, because um, from an economic point of view, uh, sheep were the most important in their culture. Um, says from the beginning, sheep mattered the most. It created security by providing food and wool. It's their whole essence is, like, is a part, is involved with the necessity for sheep. Sheep were introduced in the 1500s by the Spanish, and so uh, it just has been ingrained into their culture for hundreds of years. And I don't know if you recognize it, but that's Grandma's corral back there. <laughs> Stop the car. So we're leaving, driving off the reservation, and I, I see this out the window, and I'm in the back seat, and I go, Krinkle, stop the car. <laughs> and we got this photograph, and it's, it's really beautiful. And the more amazing thing is actually pertains to the book. I mean, Krinkle will explain that. Yeah, yeah we, we, none of us knew what it was. We thought it was a, a, a wood pile or a teepee, and um, we thought, what is this? So I actually asked one of the women in the book, and she said the only reason she knew what it was is because her, her late aunt had told her that after a couple gets married, they need a place to stay until their hogan is built. So this is the newlywed quarters <laughs> that they had, and then they would wait for the um, you know the hogan to be uh, built. And um, it's this obviously is very old. L like Bend, we in Flagstaff or Arizona have a very very dry climate. So something like this would survive pretty easily. It's like your story. I doubt it. I doubt it. But um, the mountains behind it, are, those are our Flagstaff Mountains. So, um, you know, we got a lot of help uh, and from, I got a lot of help from Kringle and Pam, and um, it's really important to appreciate them and don't work them too hard. <laughs> so, we did. They did get thirsty once in a while. So thank you for coming. These stories and photos are just a small sampling of what you can learn from the book. Thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any questions or comments we'd like to hear, let's see if we can answer them. Is there any? No, two two words. You know, that was it. That was it. No, no. We always had a translator. Thank goodness. Uh, we had some some elder women did speak English. One spoke English because she was hired by the Grand Canyon Historical Association to weave a rug at the Grand Canyon in the visitor center. So she she did learn English, but most of them did not. Yes, D. Do you know, is there, is there a significance of the, the commonality of everyone wearing purples and teals and blue colors? Is there a reason for that? 
Well, this is interesting because we see women everywhere in Flagstaff, Flagstaff dressed like this. And it's the long skirt and it's a velveteen top or whatever. And what I do know of it, which so surprised me, I don't even know, well, I don't know if you go back to Mabel's picture, but you don't know who she is, but Mabel. Mabel. That's the canon, that's the canon picture. Uh, the red dress? Yeah, red dress girl. I think you just passed it. We can do this one. She's in the slideshow. Oh, okay. Uh, her daughter was wearing actually a rug dress. If you look at it, the, the not this is her mom, but the weave was just astounding for me. I thought, oh my gosh. And that was really a very traditional outfit that was worn until, yeah, yeah, this, this, yeah. Was what, that's what they did wear, and then in the 1860s, Kit Carson really felt there was gold on the Navajo reservation, and they had to put the Indians in their place. And as they say, take the Indian out of the Indian, and they marched 8,000 Navajo to Fort Sumner in New Mexico. The women there really admired the soldiers' wives. Uh, outfits, what they wore, which were the long dresses and in, in all different colors, and um, they have now adopted that. Even to this day, you see them everywhere in town, and I don't think most people in Flagstaff even know where that has come from. But um, it, it, it's just uh, it's just history. I, I go to the Safeway, and there's history all around me. That's how I see it. That's a good question. Do you know that the boys have a similar rite of passage when they reach a certain age? This is very interesting. I guess when a boy would have his first wet dream, then a, a grandfather would take him into a sweat lodge, and I'm not sure what they were doing there, but um, that was his ceremony, and I don't hear of that at all going on now. And it's interesting. This is a matriarchal society. The women are in charge. The women call the shots. And one of my Navajo friends who's male said, we were just the gophers. You know, we didn't own, own anything. If a, if a wife wanted to divorce her husband, she just put his shoes outside the hogan. And then the divorce was, was taken care of. So I, I personally need to do more study about the aspects of the matriarchal society. You know, that is somewhat changing now. But with all these women, their strength and their survival, ways of survival, is just amazing to me. So, good question also. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. How many of the younger women um, speak Navajo to all of them? What a good question also. Uh, no. And it's so tragic because what I'm discovering with this book is that this is the most current book out there, and the last uh, there's no, there have been no books that I know of where Navajos use their own words to describe their lives. There's always an anthropologist um, that is there. And, and so, could you ask your question one more time? I, I was wondering whether the younger women Oh, yes, Navajo. yeah, and so things are fading rapidly. And what's interesting, my one friend who's Navajo, he teaches at, at our Northern Arizona University and the students that come in that are Anglo do a better job learning Navajo than his Navajo students because they don't speak Navajo well and they don't speak English well. And so they don't have a foundation to draw from, which really surprised me. You'd think they would pick, maybe they have the accent correctly, but they certainly don't have the vocabulary. And so in the book, there are several daughters that wish they had a lot of regret of wishing that they spoke the language and that they knew the culture better. Um, one of the social, one of the Navajo teachers at our local uh, Coconino High School, he told me that many Navajos don't even know what a hogan is. Because once they get to Flagstaff, they do not go back to the reservation. So I, I feel that this is a real tragedy. Yeah. Just real quick, um, I just, of the people that we interviewed, um, 
what I found was that the grandmother or the oldest lady only spoke Navajo. The middle one spoke both, and the youngest one only spoke English. That was my experience yeah, with the people we knew. Yeah, same. I agree. I agree. Yes, Amy. I was just going to add that, to my knowledge, this has happened before. The Navajo language has not been written that long. Right. When I first moved to Dilkan, which was in the 70s, it was just becoming a written language. Yeah. Yeah. So it's very rare to find a Navajo that reads and writes Navajo. Yeah. Oh, you're not kidding. That was my initial intent, <laughs> because I thought, here we've got this amazing culture and country. It was like a foreign country to me, right next door, and all people knew were perhaps the alcoholics in the, in the street. That's all they knew, and I thought that that was a travesty. So being so passionate about it, it's like I could not let it go. Um, we, uh, yeah, we went ahead and just, you know, went forward uh, with it, but can you ask your question one more time? So, so response. Oh, the top response. I, I think it's like it's exploded because it is a book with now it's very authentic. It's not my words. It's not about me. It's about them. So what what has happened is um, when we had our museum event, uh, we had well over a hundred people there. I am going to be speaking at, at the Arizona Library Association's conference. There'll be three hundred people there. All of a sudden, people from the Navajo Nation are very interested in this book. They need a documentation of their culture, and they need it coming from their own people. I just provided the, tra the, the platform. That, that was it. And um, I was a little nervous. I was interviewed by the Navajo Hopi Observer. That's the paper for the entire reservation. And I was relieved when the journalist said to me, it's obvious you are in the in the background completely with this. These are these are their stories. And um, uh, somebody had said to me, well, are you going to do another book? Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's, it was 13 years with this one, so it's so much. I, when it, was, it wasn't work when we were doing it. We were having a great time. But when I sat down with it and it was all done, I went, oh, my god. Gosh, this was so much work, and for Pam and Dave to drive all that way to do this, you know. So, yeah, yeah, fourteen thousand miles. If they were twenty years younger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But not not now. Not not now. Yeah. Are they going to use the book in school? Well, that's what I'm working on right now, and I do have a pilot project going on at our local high school, you know, and um, I have. Uh, 20, 20 books that we can, the publisher is willing to give to the school, and then I have a Navajo teacher. I've written up, I'm a teacher myself, so I wrote up a study guide to go with the book, and so we're going to show those kids these words from from their from their own people, what a hogan is. Maybe we'll take a field trip. Who knows? And then my goal, and it's pretty lofty is to see if we can get a class set of these books in every Navajo language classroom on the Navajo reservation and then the border towns around it. And um, I'm working on grants now to see if we can get that done. But I had no idea it would be like this at, at all. It just blew me away that they were in such need of something like this. So from this little idea uh, and wanting to write for white people in Flagstaff, my teacher friends, um, it's just taken off more than we ever, I think the three of us are totally overwhelmed by this. So. I just want, I just want to add, we're fortunate that we have a publisher that's in Flagstaff because she has a lot of connections. It's just, I mean, if the publisher had been in like Manhattan, it wouldn't be the same type of thing at all. They had, well, Pam and Dave told me not the same passion I have towards it, but, but they, they had their own passion.
mission towards this project. Their mission is to publish books with soul. So this book reeks of soul at this point. So that, that's been very, very, they've been perfect for us, so. And they, they were actually willing to print this in full color, which is a lot more expensive. And, um, you know, it would look good anyway, you know, black and white or color, but the color really carries the culture better, I think. <laughs> a lot of really nice rejections for, for this book, but um, what was amazing was the, the one that was very interested in it. I know it would not have been in color. I know it would have been like a six by eight size book, and not no one would pay any attention to it at all, and this, I think, really draws people, so that's important. It weighs two pounds. <laughs> I, I had to bring 20 books here in my suitcases uh, to have a, both of us sign, it, sign us for another presentation that I'm doing. So that was a big pain to... <laughs> what? Oh, the Okay, so I'm going to pull a number out of my pocket after... How many people want to, want to print? One, two, three... Okay, so... Everybody yell out the number. Yeah. 19, 17. 33. Who said 14? He said 14. Let me pick all. Oh, you win. 13. <laughs> want to purchase a copy, we have them at that register right there, and Joey will check you out. And then the last thing is, I just want to remind everyone, if you have the time to give us a review on Google, um, we still have people who don't even know that the bookstore exists, and we will be celebrating six years next month, so anything we can do to remind people that there is an independent bookstore on the west side of town is helpful. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here.